This episode is brought to you by Missouri. Guess what? Your favorite fine jewelry brand, Missouri, is hosting its biggest sale all year. From November 20th to 27th, take 20% off everything. Yes, everything. When you spend $150 or more in store and online. And you can unlock early access on November 13th when you head to Missouri.com and sign up for Missouri Plus. Their free membership program with exclusive perks. Start building your wish list and make jewelry your thing. Crypto is like the financial system, but different. It doesn't care where you come from, what you look like, your credit score, or your outrageous food delivery habits. Crypto is finance for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Visit kraken.com slash see what crypto can be to learn more. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Ventures, Inc. View PBI's disclosures at kraken.com slash legal slash disclosures. This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 95, for broadcast on the 8th of December, 2017. Coming up on Space Time, new evidence shows that the Earth got a bigger beating than thought. A new contender in the fight to understand dark matter. And a new mission to search for life on the Saturnian moon Enceladus. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study suggests that following the big impact which formed the Moon, the Earth may have been subjected to as many as five times more impact events than previously thought. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Geoscience, are based on new models of the planet's impact history based on its mineral composition. The giant impact theory involves an early proto-Earth colliding with a Mars-sized planet named Thea approximately 4.5 billion years ago. This massive impact turned both worlds into a molten magma ocean, with most of the debris melding to form the new planet Earth. However, a small amount of ejected material coalesced in orbit to form Luna, our moon. A long period of bombardment known as the late accretion, lasting hundreds of millions of years, followed the giant impact event. During this late accretion event, leftover moon-sized planetesimals continued pounding down on Earth, delivering more materials that were accreted onto the young planet. Now, scientists have simulated this protracted period of bombardment to see just how the metals and silicates from these other large bodies were integrated into the planet after the moon-forming collision. The study's lead author, Dr. Simon Marchi from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says that the new simulations showed that the late accretion mass delivered to Earth may have been significantly greater than previously thought, with important consequences for the earliest evolution of the planet. Previously, scientists estimated that the materials from planetesimals integrated during the final stage of terrestrial planet formation probably made up about half a percent of the Earth's present mass. Now, this was based on the concentrations of highly siderophile metals on the Earth's mantle. Siderophile elements are metals such as gold, platinum and iridium, which have an affinity for iron. The relative abundances of these metals in the mantle points to later creation after the Earth's core had already formed. But the estimates assume that all the highly siderophile elements delivered by the later impacts were retained in the mantle. And the thing is, the late accretion may have also involved large differentiated projectiles. And these impactors may well have concentrated their highly siderophile elements primarily within their metallic cores. And that's where the new high-resolution impact simulations come in. They show that a significant proportion of a large planetesimal's core could either descend into and be assimilated within the Earth's core, or alternatively be ricocheted back into space and escape the planet entirely. Consequently, both outcomes would reduce the amount of highly siderophile elements added to Earth's mantle. In fact, the calculations imply the change is so drastic that between two and five times as much material may have been delivered to Earth than what was previously thought. These simulations may also help explain the presence of isotropic anomalies in ancient rock samples, such as the volcanic rock Comatite. You see, these anomalies were problematic for lunar model origins, which implied a well-mixed mantle following the giant impact event. The new simulations suggest that at least some of these rocks may well have been produced long after the moon-forming impact during the late accretion. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
the road to understanding dark matter is littered with the corpses of failed hypotheses. The idea that dark matter is made up of heaps of black holes, brown dwarves, giant planets, hidden stars or clouds of gas and dust, collectively all known as massive compact halo objects or machos, is now dead. The other leading contender, great oceans of neutrinos or other yet-to-be-discovered subatomic particles, collectively known as weakly interactive massive particles or WIMPs, is a no-show, at least so far. Now, say hello to strongly interacting massive particles or SIMPs, a new candidate to try and explain dark matter, the universe's most elusive material. SIMPs were first proposed three years ago by former University of California Berkeley physicist Dr. Yonti Hochberg, now with the Hebrew University in Israel, and fellow Berkeley theoretical physicist Professor Hitoshi Moriyama. Moriyama says recent observations of a nearby galactic pileup could be evidence for the existence of SIMPs, and he anticipates that future particle physics experiments will discover one of them. Astronomers have calculated that dark matter, while invisible, makes up about 85% of the total mass budget of the universe. Because we can't see dark matter, scientists instead infer its presence by the way it interacts with the things we can see. So far, the strongest evidence for its existence comes from the motions of stars inside galaxies. Based on the amount of mass we can see, there are many cases where these galaxies should be literally flying apart, stars being flung everywhere. The fact that they're not means there must be some sort of additional invisible matter there to provide the extra gravity needed to keep everything together. In some galaxies, visible stars are so rare that dark matter must make up some 99.9% of the entire mass of the galaxy. Theorists first thought that the invisible matter was just normal matter too dim to see. Things like failed stars called brown dwarfs, burnt out stars such as white dwarfs and neutron stars too faint to see, or black holes. Problem is, these so-called compact massive halo objects, or machos, eluded discovery. And earlier this year, a survey of the Andromeda galaxy by the Subaru telescope pretty well ruled out any significant undiscovered populations of black holes. Astronomers also searched for primordial black holes left over from the very early universe by looking for sudden brightenings produced when one of these primordial black holes passes in front of some background stars and acts as a gravitational lens, causing the background stars to suddenly brighten and then dim again. They found exactly one possible example, and that's just too few to contribute significantly to the overall mass of a galaxy. Moriyama says it all means that studies have pretty well eliminated the possibility of machos being the issue. Now we turn to WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, and despite being the focus of science's attention for several decades now, they've really fed no better. If they existed, WIMPs should be fairly large, about 100 times heavier than the proton, and they should interact fairly rarely with each other, hence the term weakly interacting. They were thought to act more frequently with normal matter through gravity, helping to attract normal matter into clumps that grow into galaxies and eventually spawn stars. Trouble is, the evidence for these particles just isn't there. SIMPs, like WIMPs and MACHOs, theoretically would have to have been produced in large quantities in the early universe and have since cooled to the average cosmic temperature. But unlike WIMPs, SIMPs are theorised to interact strongly with themselves through gravity, but, and here's the kicker, react only very weakly with normal matter. One possibility proposed by Moriyama is that a SIMP is a new combination of quarks, which are the fundamental components of baryons, particles like protons and neutrons. Whereas protons and neutrons are composed of three quarks held together by force particles called gluons, a SIMP would be more like a pion, containing only two, a quark and an antiquark. The SIMP would be smaller than a WIMP, with a size or cross-section more like that of an atomic nucleus, which implies there'd be more of them than what there would be WIMPs. Larger numbers would mean that despite their weaker interaction with normal matter, primarily by scattering off it as opposed to merging with it or decaying into normal matter, they would still leave a fingerprint on normal matter. And Moriyama says he's seen just such a fingerprint in four colliding galaxies within the Abel 3827 cluster, where, surprisingly, the dark matter appears to lag behind the visible matter. He says this could be explained by interactions between dark matter in each galaxy that slows down the merger of dark matter but not that of normal matter, basically stars. One way to understand why dark matter is lagging behind the luminous matter is that the dark matter particles actually have a finite size. They scatter against each other. So when they want to move towards the rest of the system, they're getting pushed back. Moriyama says this would explain the observations because that's the exact kind of thing predicted by his hypothesis of dark matter being a bound state of new kind of quarks. 
Muriyama says SIMS also overcome a major failing of WIMP theory, namely the ability to explain the distribution of dark matter in small galaxies. There's been this long-standing puzzle. When you look at dwarf galaxies, which are very small with rather fewer stars, they tend to really be dominated by dark matter. And if you go through numerical simulations of how dark matter clumps together, they always predict that there's a large concentration of dark matter towards the centre, which Moriyama describes as a cusp. But observations seem to suggest that the concentration's far flatter, a core instead of a cusp. The core cusp problem's been considered one of the major issues with dark matter that doesn't interact other than by gravity. But if dark matter has a finite size like a simp, particles can bump into each other and disperse themselves, and that would actually flatten out the mass profile towards the centre. So, where to next? Well, ground-based experiments to look for simps are now being planned, mostly at powerful accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Another experiment planned for the International Linear Collider in Japan could also be used to look for simps. The LUX, or Large Underground Xenon Dark Matter Experiment, deep in an underground mine in South Dakota, has set the stringent limits on what a WIMP can look like, and an upgraded experiment there called LZ will push those limits even further. Of course, physicists are also looking for other dark matter candidates that aren't WIMPs, things like the long-hypothesized axion particle. The Cosmic Axion Spin Precession Experiment, or CASPER, is planning to look for perturbations in nuclear spin caused by an axion field. The Axion Dark Matter Experiment High Frequency seeks to detect axions inside a microwave cavity within a strong magnetic field as they convert to photons. Moriyama says science shouldn't abandon looking for WIMPs, but the experimental limits are getting really important. And that's the problem. You see, once you get to a certain level of measurement, even neutrinos end up being the background to the experiment, which Moriyama describes as unimaginable. Neutrinos interact so rarely with normal matter, an estimated 100 trillion are flying through your body every second without you even noticing it, and that's a feature which makes neutrinos extremely difficult to detect. I'm Stuart Gary, you're listening to Space Time. Russian physicist and entrepreneur Yuri Milner is backing a new private venture to search for the building blocks of life on the Saturnian ice moon Enceladus. Breakthrough Initiatives, a program funded by the billionaire tech investor, is now workshopping the idea which would take over from where NASA's Cassini mission left off. Cassini, which studied the Saturnian system for more than 12 years, concluded in September when the spacecraft finally ran out of fuel. During its voyage of discovery, Cassini landed its Huygens probe on the surface of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Cassini found Titan to be the only place in the solar system other than Earth to have rain flowing into streams and rivers, which then feed into lakes and seas. But scientists got an even bigger surprise when Cassini visited the ice moon Enceladus, discovering more than a hundred giant plumes of water vapour erupting high into space from tiger stripe formations at the moon's south pole. The plumes contain dissolved minerals and larger grains, and that indicates a significant underground liquid water reservoir being fed by hydrothermal vents. Of course, very similar vents are found along the mid-ocean ridges on the seafloors of Earth, and these are rich biological ecosystems, which many scientists believe may well be where life on Earth first began. Cassini's gravitational measurements of Enceladus also found that the liquid water reservoirs actually form a global subsurface ocean below a frozen crust up to 20 kilometres thick. Cassini flew through the plumes numerous times, but wasn't equipped with instruments designed to look for signs of life. And that's where Yuri Milner comes in. His organisation, Breakthrough Initiatives, is looking for alien life. His Breakthrough Listen project is spending $100 million on radio telescope time to search for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. Another one of his projects, Breakthrough Starshot, also has a $100 million budget. It's developing an armada of tiny computer chip-sized nano spacecraft, which will use laser-powered solar sails to accelerate to a fair percentage of the speed of light and fly to our nearest neighbouring star system, Alpha Centauri. Milner believes the 4.3 light-year journey could be completed in just 30 years, in other words, within our lifetime. And when they arrive at their destination, the tiny probes will study the Proxima Centauri system, which was found in 2016 to have an Earth-like planet, Proxima b, in its habitable zone. 
Milner's new Enceladus project would send a spacecraft to the Saturnian moon to collect and analyse water samples from the moon's plumes, searching for signs of life, or at least the amino acids which form the proteins that turn into the building blocks of life. Milner's trying to determine if a small, low-cost, privately funded mission to Enceladus could be ready to fly relatively soon to study these plumes before a larger, more expensive NASA mission, which could be at least 10 years off. NASA plans to announce its Enceladus mission in 2019, with a launch date sometime in the mid-2020s. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. This fascinates me because we've talked about uh, sending missions to ice moons and ice planets before and, and looking for life. Well, now somebody wants to do it, and this could be a private venture, which is uh, fabulous if they can pull it off. This private mission to get to an Enceladus and see if there's anything lurking under the surface. Wouldn't that be exciting? Uh, would it not? And this story comes on the back, I think, of the... Uh... Cassini mission, which, as you know, came to an end on the 15th of September when the Cassini spacecraft plunged into the upper atmosphere of Saturn, melted and became part of Saturn's atmosphere, which I think is highly poetic. Mm. The spacecraft, of course, made many, many discoveries, perhaps the most exciting of which was that Saturn's moon Enceladus, whose structure we know is a rocky core overlain with a global ocean of water, salty water, which itself is overlain by an ice layer. The spacecraft flew through plumes of ice crystals, these fountains of ice crystals which erupt from the subsurface ocean round about Enceladus's South Pole. And many discoveries were made by those flights through the ice plumes, including the fact that, first of all, yes, these crystals are ice crystals. Secondly, they contain nanoparticles of silicates, and silicates are just bits of rock. Yeah. These tell you not only that that ocean has a, a seabed which is in contact with rock, but also that that rock is almost certainly places where hydrothermal activity occurs. And by that, I mean these things that we have on the floor of our deep oceans on Earth, these black and white smokers, which are essentially flows of warmed water, which have seeped through into the rock deep down underneath the ocean floor, been heated by the Earth's mantle, which is not far below that, and then spurted back up. And these places are thought to be one of the possible sites of the origin of life on Earth. Mm. So the equation is this, that we know from those silicates and also from the detection of something called molecular hydrogen by Cassini, we know that hydrothermal vents exist on the ocean floor of Enceladus. Also, we know that we get free samples of what that ocean water is like and what it might contain because we've got these plumes of ice that are being erupted from there. <clears throat> so you put those two together and what's happened from that is the idea of space missions dedicated to Enceladus. And there are at least three which have been planned by NASA and ESA. NASA, of course, no, needs no introduction. ESA, the European Space Agency. And they've all got delightful names, actually. The one I like is ELF. ELF is the Enceladus Life Finder. This is a spacecraft whose particle detectors and mass spectrometers and other equipment is tuned to look for things like amino acids and proteins, which were not detectable by Cassini because Cassini wasn't set up to do that. It was set up to look for minerals and things of that sort, all of which it did most successfully. But nobody ever thought that we'd go to a place where we could look for proteins and amino acids and uh, lipids and things of that sort. So ELF is one. The other one I like is uh, Selfie. And Selfie <laughs> is the submillimeter Enceladus Life Fundamentals instrument. And what this is, is a device that will pick up the submillimeter signature of molecules. You and I have talked about this kind of thing before because ALMA, which is a telescope in the high Atacama Desert in northern Chile, is a submillimeter wave telescope. And it's been probing the atmospheres of other stars and things like that and finding molecules which themselves are very suggestive, carbon containing molecules. Now, you can do the same thing, but not from Earth and not pointing at a distant star. You can do it from a spacecraft that is in the vicinity of these ice plumes. And you can look for the molecular structure that's in the ice plumes. And maybe you could find the same sorts of things, you know, like amino acids and other building blocks of life. And there's one more. The Europeans are planning one called E2T, which is Enceladus to Titan. And it's a mission that would take in both those worlds, because Titan's another place where maybe life has taken hold. Anyway, that's the backstory. Yes, uh, Andrew. Yes. Oh, we've finished. And that's oh, all we've, we've got, got time, time for for yes, this week. So, what a shame. So the, that's the backstory. But of course, these missions, they're NASA and ESA missions. They cost probably in the region of a billion, maybe more 
dollar dollars um, they will probably have a preparation time of seven eight nine ten years or something like that maybe a flight time of three four five years to get wow. to Saturn it's a long long process you've got to be and patient so, You've got to be patient, unless your name is Yuri Milner. Yes. And Yuri Milner is this Russian billionaire who's already funded what's called the Breakthrough Initiatives Project. And that's a set of four projects, the most prominent of which is Breakthrough Listen, which is given $100 million to, which uses time on two major radio telescopes. One is the Parkes Radio Telescope here in, in New South Wales to listen for signals from extraterrestrial intelligences. So he's funded that. He's funded something called Breakthrough Starshot, which is basically a, a design study for a flotilla of micro spacecraft which would be beamed on a laser beam towards Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to us, 4.2 light years away, which we know has a planet around it, at least one planet around it. But what he's saying is, wait a minute, I've got a lot of money. Maybe, just maybe, and he floated this in a recent conference, maybe there's a way of fast tracking this project to do a sort of quick and dirty recce around these plumes by sending a dedicated spacecraft, probably using, you know, SpaceX hardware, things of that sort, mm -hmm. to get to Saturn quickly, to have a quick look, see if we see any signs of amino acids, proteins, lipids, all the rest of it, and then let the NASA and ESA projects do the real uh, heavy lifting in terms of the details of what we might find there. It's a really interesting proposal. My guess is, and this is, forgive me, Yuri, if you're listening to this, my guess is that he hasn't got enough money. Oh. But he's clearly a person who can engage other funding agencies. It may well be, he's a bit like Colin Pillinger, who was that British scientist who gathered funding to send Beagle 2, his spacecraft right. to Mars, yeah. um, which we've talked about many times. I think he's that kind of person. If he can do that, well, just maybe this might work. And what's really great about it, Andrew, is if he does it quickly enough, we'll be able to talk about it on Space Nuts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we might be able to break the news that there That's is life beneath yeah. the icy surface of Enceladus. Let me just throw a, a curveball here at you, Fred. I know you love questions without notice. <laughs> but uh, let's assume all these missions get there and are successful in, in doing what they need to do to search for signs of life. What would be the odds of a discovery? Uh, yes, that is a curveball question. It's one that you're entitled to ask, and it's one to which <laughs> no, one, no one in the universe has the answer. Well, somebody in the universe might have the answer, especially if there are advanced organisms beneath this, uh, yeah. the soil, the seas of, uh, or the ice of Enceladus. We don't know. And that's partly because the actual processes, the chemical processes which lead to that transition between prebiotic chemical situation where you've got molecules reacting with one one another and something that you can call life which of course involves all kinds of things like metabolism things like the possibility of self-replication things like the possibility of a darwinian evolution mm. if you leave these things to their own devices to the survival of the fittest things these are the kinds of things that people point to as distinguishing life from mere chemistry but nobody knows just how difficult that transition is the, the feeling i have to say in the world of astrobiology is that it is a fairly straightforward transition and if you've got the right chemicals you will get the right living organisms there'll probably be microbes you need long chain molecules that can form cell walls to contain these reactions within their within a cell rather than just have them in an ocean floating around and trying to react with the next molecule which might be a mile away or something like that yeah. so the thinking is very positive very optimistic in terms of the origin of single celled molecules the, the next step to get from single celled organism optimism about single cell organisms, less optimism about multi-celled organisms, how common they might be. Mm. Although the, um, the the thinking is in terms of single-celled organisms that, uh, as you and I discussed not so long ago, uh, there may well be a lot more of this in the universe than we've ever considered. So yeah. um, you know, this trip to Enceladus could well be the first... Uh, could result in the first major discovery. Uh, let's hope so. I think it would be exciting. Absolutely. I think it's, it's a great idea and good on you. And Yuri, of course, being human beings, we will send invasion forces and deal <laughs> with the problem promptly. Of course. That's Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. 
If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. New computer simulations indicate that the Jovian ice moon Europa may have plate tectonics similar to Earth. The findings, reported in the Journal of Geophysical Research Planets, could have important implications for providing chemical nutrients to any potential life forms in the oceans beneath the moon's frozen surface. The study uses computer modelling to show that subduction, when one tectonic plate slides underneath another and then sinks deep into a planet's interior, is physically possible in Europa's ice shell. The new findings bolster earlier studies of Europa's surface geology that found regions where the Moon's ice sheets appear to be expanding in ways similar to the spreading of mid-ocean ridges on Earth. And the possibility of subduction adds another piece to the tectonic puzzle. The study's lead author, Assistant Professor Brandon Johnson from Brown University, says as the earlier research found evidence of extension and spreading, he wanted to know where that material goes. Of course, on Earth, the answer is subduction. And Johnson's new computer simulations of Europa show that under reasonable assumptions for conditions on the Jovian moon, subduction could also be happening there. Johnson says that idea would be incredibly exciting because the moon's surface crust is enriched with oxidants and other chemical food for life. So you see, subduction provides a means for that food to come into contact with Europa's subsurface global ocean, located about 19 to 25 kilometres beneath the ice sheets. On Earth, subduction is driven largely by differences in temperature between the descending slab and the surrounding mantle. The crustal material is much cooler than the mantle material and therefore denser. And that increased density provides the negative buoyancy needed through convection to sink a slab deep into the mantle. Though previous geological studies had hinted that something like subduction could be happening on Europa, it wasn't really clear exactly how that process would work on an icy world. But the thing is, there's evidence that Europa's ice shell has two distinct layers. There's a thin outer lid of very cold ice that sits atop a layer of slightly warmer convecting ice. And if a plate from the outer ice lid were pushed down into the warmer ice below, its temperature would quickly warm to that of the surrounding ice. At that point, the slab would have the same density as the surrounding ice and would therefore stop descending. But the model developed by Johnson and colleagues showed a way that subduction could happen on Europa regardless of temperature differences. The model showed that if there were varying amounts of salt in the surface ice shell, it could provide the necessary density differences for a slab to subduct. Johnson says adding salt to an ice slab would be just like adding little weights to it, because the salt would be denser than ice. So, rather than temperature, the authors show that differences in the salt content, hence density of the ice, could enable subduction to happen on Europa. And, according to Johnson, there's good reason to suspect that variations in salt content do exist on Europa. There's geological evidence for occasional water upwelling from Europa's global subsurface ocean, a process similar to the upwelling of magma from Earth's mantle. That upwelling would leave high salt content in the crust under which it rises. There's also the possibility of cryovolcanism, where salty ocean contents actually spray out onto the surface, similar to the Enceladean plumes at Saturn. So... In addition to bolstering the case for a habitable ocean on Europa, Johnson says the research also suggests a new place in the solar system to study a process that's played a crucial role in the evolution of our own planet. If scientists can study plate tectonics in an alien world like Europa, it might help them better understand how plate tectonics got started on Earth. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies with December Skywatch. December is the final month of the year on both the Julian and Gregorian calendars. December got its name from the Latin word decem, meaning ten. That's because it was originally the tenth month of the year in the old Roman calendar, which began in March. It became the twelfth month only when January and February were added to the other end. 
Let's start our tour of the December night skies in the west, where midway up from the horizon we find Formaholt, the brightest star in the constellation Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish. Formaholt is a young, white, spectral type A main sequence star, about 1.8 times the diameter of the Sun, located about 25 light years away. When we talk about main sequence stars, we refer to stars that are undergoing hydrogen fusion into helium in their core. It's the process that makes stars like our Sun shine. In 2008, astronomers detected planets orbiting around Formaholt. It's not known if anyone there was looking back. At Simply Safe Home Security, your safety is the only thing that matters. That's why you get 24-7 professional monitoring for less than a dollar a day. Because every home deserves to be protected. Right now, get 50% off the whole home security system named the best of 2023 by U.S. News and World Report. Visit simplysafecom slash Spotify to save big today. Advanced Home Security, 24-7 professional monitoring for less than a dollar a day. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Welcome to the Agrihood. Carnes Crossroads is a new home community with a farm to table lifestyle. Just outside of Charleston, here, community is defined by gathering together and our deep connection to nature. Our future farm and amenities are taking root and blooming into something you've always dreamed of in a fun, healthy, and social environment. Come home to the Agrihood, where you can plant roots and thrive. Learn more at carnescrossroads.com. 5,000 years ago, the ancient Mesopotamians used Formaholt to mark the northern hemisphere winter solstice. Turning to the left of Formaholt is Alpha Aridne or Achenar, the brightest star in the constellation of Eridanus, the river. Located about 139 light years away, Achenar has about 7 times the diameter of the sun and rotates some 15 times faster, giving it an oblate spheroid shape. You see, the effect of that rapid rotation makes the star flatten at the top and bottom and bulge out in the middle. In fact, its equatorial diameter is about 50% greater than its polar diameter. Achenar is actually part of a multiple star system, together with Alpha Aridne A and Alpha Aridne B. The primary star, Alpha Aridne A, is a hot blue spectral type B main sequence star. Its smaller companion, Alpha Aridne B, is a spectral type A white star. The pair orbit each other at a distance of about 12 astronomical units, an astronomical unit being the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres, or if you'd prefer, 8.3 light minutes. Moving further left from Achenar, just above the horizon, is Canopus, the brightest star in the southern constellation of Carina the Keel, and the second brightest star in the night sky after Sirius. Canopus is a white giant, nearing the end of its life. It's located about 310 light years away. It has about 8.5 times the mass of the Sun, and has expanded out to about 71 times the Sun's diameter. Interestingly, Canopus has some 1300 times the brightness of the Sun, and is in fact the brightest star within 700 light years of Earth. Its name originates in mythology from the time of the Trojan Wars, and the navigator for Menelaus, the king of Sparta. Located between Canopus and the Southern Cross, also in Carina, in the Trumpet 16 open star cluster, is the ticking time bomb that's the binary system of Eta Carina. Eta Carina are a pair of huge blue stars, undergoing the final violent phase of their existence before exploding in a massive core collapse supernova. Located some 7,500 light years away, the pair are some 5 million times more luminous than the Sun, but they're enshrouded in a thick cocoon of gas and dust called the Homunculus Nebula. This nebula was created when Eta Carina underwent a spectacular eruption beginning in around 1837. Known as the Great Eruption, it eventually reached its peak in 1843 when it was one of the brightest objects in the night sky, before gradually fading away again by 1856. Eta Carina underwent another smaller eruption in 1892 and has again been steadily brightening ever since 1940. The two main stars in the Eta Carina system have an eccentric orbit with a period of 5.54 years. The primary is a peculiar star, similar to a luminous blue variable star, which may have originally had between 150 and 250 times the mass of our Sun, of which around 30 solar masses has been lost. This monster is the only star known to produce ultraviolet laser emissions. The secondary star, also hot and highly luminous, is a spectral type O main sequence blue star, probably around 30 to 80 times the mass of our Sun. No one knows exactly when Eta Carina will go supernova. It could be in millions of years' time, or it could be tomorrow. 
As a single star, a star originally around, say, 150 times the mass of our Sun, it would typically reach core collapse as a wolf rayet star within 3 million years. At low metallicity, that is primarily hydrogen and helium with very few other heavier elements, many massive stars will collapse directly into black holes with no visible explosion, or at best a subluminous supernova with maybe a small fraction producing a parent stability supernova. We spoke about that on Space Time the other week. But at solar metallicity and above, there's expected to be sufficient mass loss before collapse to allow a visible supernova. Now, if there is still a large amount of expelled material close to the star, the shock formed by the supernova explosion impacting the circumstellar material can convert the kinetic energy into radiation, resulting in a superluminous supernova or hypernova, several times more luminous than a typical core collapse supernova and much longer lasting. Now, highly massive progenitors like this one may also eject sufficient nickel to cause a superluminous supernova simply from the radioactive decay. The resulting remnant would then be a black hole. That's because it's highly unlikely that such a massive star could ever lose sufficient mass from its core not to exceed the limit for a neutron star. Of course, the existence of its massive companion brings lots of other possibilities into play. Now, if Eta Carina A was rapidly stripped of its outer layers, it might become a less massive WC or WO type star when core collapse is reached. And this would result in a type 1b or 1c supernova due to the lack of hydrogen and possibly helium. And that's important because these supernovae are thought to be one of the possible originators for some types of gamma ray bursts. Several unusual supernovae and imposters have already been compared to Eta Carina as examples of its possible fate. One of the most compelling is SN2009IP, a blue supergiant, which first underwent a supernova imposter event in 2009, which had similarities to what's thought to have been Eta Carina's great eruption. But it didn't die, instead undergoing an even brighter outburst in 2012, which is likely to have been its true supernova. One theory of Eta Carina's ultimate fate is that it would collapse to form a stellar mass black hole, with the energy then released as jets along its axis of rotation as gamma ray bursts. A typical core collapse supernova at the distance of Eta Carina would from Earth most likely look as bright as Venus, but a superluminous supernova could be some five magnitudes brighter, potentially the brightest supernova in recorded history. Eta Carina is not expected to produce a gamma ray burst as its axis of rotation isn't currently aimed near the Earth. And at 7,500 light years, the star is unlikely to directly affect terrestrial life forms on Earth thanks to our planet's atmosphere and magnetosphere. Still, the Earth's ozone layer could be damaged, as would any orbiting spacecraft and any astronauts aboard them at the time. In fact, at least one paper has projected the complete loss of the Earth's ozone layer as a plausible consequence of an Eta Carina supernova the loss of the ozone layer would result in a significant increase in ultraviolet radiation reaching the Earth's surface from the Sun. That radiation would be enough to mutate, if not kill off, many surface life forms. The good news is that for a typical supernova to do this sort of damage, our best calculations indicate it would need to be within 50 light years of Earth. And even a potential hypernova would still need to be closer than what Eta Carina is. OK, let's turn to the east now. And looking just above the horizon is the star that outshines Canopus to take the title as the brightest star in the night sky. Sirius, the dog star. In fact, Sirius is twice as bright as Canopus. It's actually two stars, a young spectral type A main sequence white star, Sirius A, which is about twice as big and 25 times brighter than the sun, and Sirius B, a small white dwarf, the remnant white-hot core of a dead star. The system is between 200 and 300 million years old. It was originally composed of two bright white stars. The more massive of these stars, Sirius B, consumed its resources and expanded to become a red giant before shedding its outer layers and collapsing into its current state as a white dwarf around 120 million years ago. At a distance of just 8.6 light years, Sirius is the fifth nearest star to the Sun, and it's getting closer every day. You see, Sirius is gradually moving towards our solar system, so it will gradually continue to increase in brightness over the next 60,000 years. After that time, it'll start moving away again. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Sirius is also known colloquially as the Dog Star, reflecting its prominence in the constellation Canis Major, the Greater Dog. It was the helical rising of Sirius which marked the flooding of the Nile in ancient Egypt and the hot, sultry dog days of summer for the ancient Greeks. By the way, helical rising refers to the first time of the year when a star becomes visible above the eastern horizon for a brief moment just before sunrise. 
By carefully monitoring and watching Sirius' movements across the sky, the ancient Egyptians determined that it would be visible every night for 295 and a quarter nights, followed by 70 nights of absence. It was these facts which allowed them to determine that a year was 365 and a quarter days long. And of course they did this thousands of years ago, which makes it a truly amazing achievement. Not far from Sirius, towards the east-northeastern skies right about now, just above the horizon, is the constellation of Orion the Hunter, one of the best-known constellations in the night sky. In fact, when I go out sky-watching, the two constellations I always look for to work out where I am are the Southern Cross and Orion the Hunter. Now, when you look in the constellation Orion, you'll see a really bright red star. It's the red supergiant Betelgeuse, better known to most people these days as Betelgeuse. Just don't say the name three times. Betelgeuse is one of the largest and most luminous stars visible to the unaided eye. Located some 430 light years away, this bloated old star nearing the end of its life is truly massive. It's some 1,100 times the diameter and around 100,000 times the brightness of our sun. Like Eta Carina, Betelgeuse is destined to explode as a core collapse supernova sometime in the near future. And again, we don't know exactly when. It could be in a thousand years, it could be tomorrow. Betelgeuse marks the right shoulder of Orion the Hunter, although it's all upside down from the perspective of anyone in the Southern Hemisphere, as Orion was a hunter in Greek mythology, and so the constellation was viewed from the Northern Hemisphere. The earliest depiction that has been linked to the constellation Orion is a prehistoric mammoth ivory carving found in a cave in the Arch Valley in West Germany in 1979. Archaeologists have estimated the carving, or at least the mammoth it came from, to be dated to approximately 32,000 to 38,000 years ago. The distinctive pattern of Orion has been recognised in numerous cultures around the world, including ancient Babylonian star catalogues dating back to the late Bronze Age. In Greek mythology, Orion was a gigantic, supernaturally strong hunter of ancient times. He was the son of a Gorgon and Poseidon, also known as Neptune, the god of the sea in the Greco-Roman tradition. The story goes, according to Greek mythology, the goddess Gaia became angry with Orion after he boasted that he was such a good hunter he'd kill every animal on earth. So to stop him, she sent a scorpion to sting Orion to death. However, Ophusius the serpent bearer intervened, reviving Orion with an antidote. It's the reason why the constellation Scorpius chases Orion across the sky, with the constellation Ophusius standing midway between them. The other major stars in Orion include the blue supergiant Rigel, Orion's left foot. Having exhausted the hydrogen in its core, Rigel is no longer on the main sequence. It's swollen out to between 79 and 115 times the sun's radius. It's now fusing heavy elements in its core. Eventually, it'll explode as a supernova and collapse to form a neutron star. Rigel is another true stellar monster. It's estimated to be anywhere from 120,000 to 279,000 times as luminous as the sun. It's actually a binary system located 860 light years away. Its companion star Rigel B is some 500 times fainter than the supergiant Rigel A, and it's only visible with a telescope. In fact, Rigel B itself is what's known as a spectroscopic binary system, comprising two main sequence blue-white stars. A spectroscopic binary is a double star systems orbiting so close to each other as seen from Earth, they can't be visually separated. So in order to tell them apart, you need to get their spectroscopic signatures. The two stars making up Rigel B are estimated to be 3.9 and 2.9 times the mass of the Sun, respectively. And one of these stars, Rigel BB, may itself be a binary. Rigel B also appears to have a very close visual companion, Rigel C, almost identical in appearance. The third brightest star in Orion is Bellatrix, Orion's left shoulder. It's a spectral type B main sequence blue star, with about 8.6 times the mass and 6 times the radius of the Sun. Bellatrix is about 250 light years away. It has an estimated age of about 25 million years. That's old enough for a star of this mass to have consumed the hydrogen in its core and begin to evolve away from the main sequence as a blue giant. If you look at the three stars which make up Orion's belt, you see another three stars which make up Orion's sword hanging down from the belt, and again, for those in the southern hemisphere, it'll appear to be hanging upwards rather than down. Now, if you look carefully at the middle star in Orion's sword, you'll notice it's a bit fuzzy compared to the other two. That's because it's not a star at all, but the Great Orion Nebula, Messier 42. Located just 1,377 light-years away, Messier 42 is the nearest massive star-forming region to Earth. 
The M42 Nebula is estimated to be about 24 light years across and has a mass more than 2,000 times that of the Sun. The Orion Nebula is one of the most scrutinized and photographed objects in the night sky and is among the most intensely studied celestial features. In fact, the nebulas revealed much about the process of how stars and planetary systems are formed from collapsing clouds of molecular gas and dust. By studying M42, astronomers have directly observed protoplanetary disks, brown dwarfs, intense and turbulent motions of gas, and the photoionizing effects of massive nearby stars in the nebula. The Orion Nebula contains a very young open cluster known as the trapezium due to the astrium of its four primary stars. The trapezium is a component of the much larger Orion Nebula cluster, an association of about 2,800 stars within a diameter of about 20 light years. Also in Orion is the famous Horsehead Nebula, one of the most identifiable features in the night sky. One of the astronomical highlights of December is the annual Geminids meteor shower, which usually peaks around December the 13th and 14th. Radiating out from the direction of the constellation Gemini, the Geminids are unusual in that they're not generated by a comet as most other meteor showers are, but are instead produced by the debris trail left behind by the asteroid 3200 Phaeton. That makes the Geminids, together with the Quadrantids, the only major meteor showers not originating from comets. 3200 Phaeton is incredibly unusual. Its high orbital eccentricity far more closely resembles that of a comet than asteroid. And in fact, it may well be an asteroid that's run out of the volatile gases that characterize a comet. Phaeton's orbit crosses all the inner terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. And on December the 16th this year, it'll fly within 10,312,000 kilometers of the Earth, its closest approach to our planet in 40 years. But an even closer approach will occur on December the 14th, 2093, when it will pass within less than 3 million kilometers of the Earth. The 5 kilometer wide asteroid is classified as potentially hazardous. And that's interesting because Phaeton's named after the son of the Greek sun god Helios. Legend has it that Phaeton almost destroyed the Earth by stealing Helios' chariot and scorching the Earth with the sun, almost causing the apocalypse. Phaeton approaches the sun closer than any other named asteroid, with a perihelion of less than 21 million kilometers, less than half that of Mercury's perihelion distance. Coming so close to the sun causes Phaeton's surface temperature to reach more than 750 degrees Celsius. And observations by NASA's Stereo spacecraft found dust trails radiating off its surface. And in 2010, Phaeton was detected ejecting dust. Scientists think the intense heat generated by its close approach to the sun causes fractures in the gravel and rocks on the asteroid surface, similar to mud cracks in a dry riverbed. Phaeton's composition also fits this notion of a cometary origin. It's classified as a B-type asteroid because it's composed of dark material. B-type asteroids are thought to be primitive, volatile, rich remnants from the early solar system. Its composition, its orbit and its dust trails have all led astronomers to refer to 32 Phaeton as a rock comet. The Geminids meteors have a yellowish hue and they tend to be a bit larger and more solid than typical meteors from comets. They also move more slowly, travelling at a sedate 35 km per second compared to some cometary meteor showers which can reach speeds of 72 km a second. Interestingly, the Geminids are thought to be intensifying every year, with recent showers seeing up to 160 meteors an hour under optimal conditions. In the Northern Hemisphere this year, you can expect to see up to 120 meteors per hour between midnight and 4am, but only from a dark sky. In the Southern Hemisphere, you won't see nearly as many Geminids this year round, perhaps 10 to 20 an hour. That's because for Southerners, the radiant won't rise above the horizon. Now, for listeners in the Northern Hemisphere, there's also a second meteor shower in December, the Ursids, radiating out from Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper. The Ursids are generated by debris left behind by the comet 8P Tuttle. They're a compact stream, peaking on the night of December 22nd and the morning hours of December 23rd. Just look towards the bowl of the Little Dipper, and you'll probably see about 10 meteors an hour. December also marks the December solstice. It'll occur at 3.28 Australian Eastern Daylight Time on the morning of Friday, December the 22nd. That's 11.28 in the morning of Thursday, December the 21st, US Eastern Standard Time, and 16.28 in the afternoon of December the 21st, Greenwich Mean Time. It's when the sun reaches zenith, appearing to be directly above the Tropic of Capricorn. In the Northern Hemisphere, it's the winter solstice. And in the United States and most places north of the equator, it marks the first day of winter. The good news being that from now on, the days start getting longer. 
Of course, south of the equator, it means summer's well and truly arrived and the days start getting shorter. On the day of the December solstice, Earth's south pole is tilted towards the sun. The sun rises south of east and sets south of west, reaching its most southerly declination of 23.4 degrees. The seasons are governed by the tilt of Earth's axis as it journeys around the sun in a year. And when the south pole of the Earth is tilted towards the sun, it's the southern hemisphere summer. Six months later, when the south pole is tilted away from the sun, it's the southern hemisphere winter. And in between these, we have the autumn and spring equinox. Earth's closest orbital position to the sun, perihelion, occurs about two weeks after the December solstice. And its furthest orbital position from the sun, aphelion, occurs about two weeks after the June solstice. This means the next perihelion will occur on Wednesday, January the 3rd, 2018, at 16.34 in the afternoon Australian Eastern Daylight Time. That's 12.34 a.m. U.S. Eastern Standard Time and 5.34 in the morning Greenwich Mean Time. However, it's worth remembering, temperatures on Earth aren't determined by the Earth's orbital distance from the Sun, but rather the angle of the Sun's rays striking the Earth. In summer, the Sun is high in the sky and the rays hit the Earth at a steep angle. In winter, the sun's lower in the sky, and so the rays from the sun strike the earth at a shallow angle. In most parts of the world, seasons begin on the day of the solstice, or equinox. However, Australia is weird. Instead, seasons begin on the first day of a particular calendar month. In March for autumn, they never call it fall, in June for winter, September for spring, and the first day of December for summer. And now, with the rest of the December night sky, someone who isn't strange, Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. OK, so let's start with what we can see in the mid-evening sky. The band of stars that we call the Milky Way, which is just our galaxy seen from the inside, is stretching right across the sky, at the eastern part of the sky, from south to north, and then extending around, hugging the northern horizon. Way down south, the famous Southern Cross is upside down at the moment, and depending on your latitude, this your southern latitude, it's either right on the horizon for someone viewing from, say, the latitude of Sydney, and that, that's the theoretical flat horizon if you don't have any obstructions in the way, like buildings and trees and hills and things. So if you do, then you're probably won't see the Southern Cross. If you're further south than Sydney, then you've got a good chance of seeing it at the moment. But if you're sort of further north than Sydney, Brisbane, Queensland, Northern Territory, that sort of thing, then you're not going to see the Southern Cross at the moment, at least not in the mid-evening hours at the moment. Later on in the wee hours of the night, the Earth will have turned a bit and the Cross will have risen a little bit and it'll be sort of on its side in the sort of south-southeast. Question without notice here. Is it true you can use the Southern Cross to work out where the South Pole is? You certainly can use the Southern Cross to work out uh, roughly where South is, yeah. In the northern sky, the people in the northern hemisphere are very lucky. There's a star that's right at the northern the celestial pole. It's called Polaris, obvious name, and it's, it's more, more or less exactly on what they call the celestial pole, which well, is... For the next sort of 22,000 the... years at least, anyway. For, for a while, yeah, and uh, if you can see it, if there are no clouds in the way, then you know that that's directly north. Down south here, we don't have an equivalent bright star. There is a star that's almost on the south celestial pole. It's called Sigma Octantis. It's in the constellation of Octans, but it's faint, so you wouldn't see it with the naked eye. But if you can see the Southern Cross, there, yeah, there, there, you can work out which way is south. There are various ways of doing it. They're all a bit rough, but they're good enough to get you out of trouble if you're lost. So if you can see the Southern Cross and the two pointer stars, for instance, then draw a line between the Southern Cross and the two pointer stars and then go halfway along that line and draw a line at right angles to it down towards, sort of heading towards the horizon a bit. That'll drop you straight down south, basically. Another easy way of doing it roughly is if you just look at the Southern Cross, it's a kite shape. It's got a long axis and a short axis. Just extend the, the long axis by about four and a half times into the sky, and that'll take you to roughly the South Celestial Pole. Just drop a line from that straight down to the horizon, and that's more or less south. You know, I visited the Navy base in uh, Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, and I went on board the, the battleship they have there and had a look around this fantastic battleship and I was just going past some lockers or something in, uh, down one of the corridors inside this ship and stuck there on one of these corridors was some celestial navigation stuff and part of it was how to find north and how to find south using the stars and they had exactly these methods in the northern hemisphere just look for this Polaris star and if you had in the southern hemisphere use this southern cross technique and this is from the 1940s been there that long so it's a great
great method to use. As long as the clouds aren't blocking your way, you can certainly use the Southern Cross to more or less find roughly south. And if you know south, then you know north and you know east and west. It's amazing yeah. how the old techniques still work. When the Apollo astronauts went to the moon for the first time, I think that was Apollo 8, they took a sextant mm. with them just in case their onboard computers weren't any good for what they needed to do. They were able to navigate using a, an old Navy sextant. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, um, lots and lots of unmanned space missions have gone out there into the solar system. They have star trackers on board. These sort of little mini telescopes are pointing outwards that are aligned in the right way so that they can see certain stars in their fields of view. So did the SR-71 Blackbird, the uh, world's fastest aircraft when it was flying. Yeah, and look, lots of commercial airliners did until uh, some were even doing it into the uh, early 80s, although things called INS, inertial navigation systems, had taken over by then, and then much later, of course, GPS. Mm. But you go back and look at all the earlier generations of commercial aircraft, a lot of them had bubbles on their roofs above the cockpit, and that's where the navigator would look out to do his star sighting. Yeah, so it's been used a lot. You know, astronomy is the basis of navigation. It always has been. Prior to, go back thousands of years, prior to people really starting to sort out what was happening in the night sky, the classical thing from antiquity is around the Mediterranean coastline, ships would hug the coastline to not get out of sight of land because then they wouldn't know where they were and they'd only sail during day or sail or row during day in good weather, that kind of thing, and they would hug the coastline. But then once people started to work out, oh, hang on, there's these patterns in the sky and they repeat all the time and you can use the stars to work out which direction you are and which way you're going, and then they're able to, people are able to travel further distances out of sight of land and know where they're going. And astronomy and the stars have always been the basis of navigation, and they still are. And not just nav- navigation in terms of where you are, but also when you are, because astronomy is also the basis of our timekeeping system. And even though today we have GPS, and even though we have atomic clocks, they still need to be referenced to, to something that doesn't change. And the things that don't really change a great deal are things out there in space that are a long way away, so far away that, yeah, they um, they effectively don't move. So it's really interesting that you can use the Southern Cross if you're lost out in the bush to find south and then northeast and west and maybe get yourself out of trouble. But even our entire technological age is still based on using the sky to tell us where we are and what time it is. For our friends listening in New York City right now, New Year's Eve, do you have the ball going down? The- yeah, look, lots of harbours around the world had time balls. Uh, mm. Sydney and Australia, all the, major, all the major cities had time balls and the ball would might be raised up and then dropped at one o'clock in the afternoon local time and all the ships in the, the harbours would be watching for it and that way they'd be able to reset their clocks because clocks weren't as accurate as they are now of course, the chronometers they were using, they'd need to be reset to the correct time. And that was so important the, for longitude? Longitude, yeah. yeah. Longitude, for finding your longitude, yeah and for that you needed time, you needed accurate time so um, yeah and look, you say the time ball in Times Square yep. is still used in sort of ceremonial occasions, the time ball at Sydney Observatory as far as I know is still raised. It is indeed, uh, the, the big yellow one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... Uh, I celebrated... Uh, well, I didn't really celebrate the turn of the century there. I celebrated a year before the turn of the century. The fake, the fake, the fake turn of the one century, in, yeah. in, the, in 1999 to 2000, I was at the Sydney Observatory for the event. Well, there you are. I, I think I totally ignored that whole thing during that time, of course, because it was the wrong year. Yes. It was just completely the wrong year. And before no, we get any letters or emails, what Jonathan is telling you is correct. The start of the 21st century was actually on New Year's Day 2001, because one is the first number... In in the sequence, not zero. That's right, because 2,000 years have not passed until the end of the 2,000th year. Not the beginning of the 2,000th year. 2,000 years had expired at the end of the 2,000th year. And anyone That's who wants to complain, you can feel free to do so. Just uh, contact me directly, John Laws, Carol. That's right. <laughs> Yes. Uh, anyway, let's not get into that one. Let's get back to the sky, shall okay. we? So we were talking about the Southern Cross. Now, if you have dark skies, you should be able to make out, uh, way above the Southern Cross, the two nearest sizable galaxies to our own, the large and small Magellanic Clouds, named after Magellan, the famous explorer. And they're situated really nice and high directly south. And they look like faint, fuzzy clouds, which is where they get their name from. But in fact, they are galaxies full of millions of stars. To the left of the large cloud is a really bright star called Canopus. And this is the second brightest star in the night sky. And then if you look a little bit further around to the left still, you'll see an even brighter star that's called Sirius, which is the brightest star in the night sky. It's also known as the Dog Star because it's in the constellation Canis Major, or the Greater Dog. Now, in the eastern sky, about halfway up from the horizon, and this is still mid-evening, is the really impressive constellation Orion, the Hunter. We've spoken about this many, many times. You just can't miss it, with its beautiful three stars in a row forming the Hunter's Belt. And on either side of the belt, you've got the bright stars Rigel and Betelgeuse. And a bit further to 
to the left of Orion, you're actually going north, but left as you look at it in the sky, you should see a reddish star that makes up one corner of a triangle or wedge of stars. Now, this star is called Aldebaran, and the triangle is a star cluster called the Hyades. Have a look through some binoculars at this, if you can get hold of some. It's a really, really pretty sight, this beautiful star cluster, as is another smaller-looking star cluster, uh, still a bit further around to the left. We're looking sort of north, north, east now, and this star cluster is called the Pleiades, and it's also known as the Seven Sisters, so-called because many people, when they look at it from dark skies, they can make out seven, maybe six, sometimes eight of its stars with just the naked eye. In fact, it's a beautiful star cluster that has about a thousand stars. Now, really, if you've got a pair of binoculars or you can get hold of some, take a look at the Pleiades through binoculars. And you know what's interesting about the Pleiades? No matter where you are in the world, there seems to be an ancient story about the Pleiades being seven sisters or seven women, and they're being chased by this man, which is usually Orion, the hunter. And these stories are on different continents, South America, North America, Eurasia, Australia, many places in Africa as well. So these are all totally unconnected cultural backgrounds, but all with the same story about the same group of stars. Yep, indeed. And... Um it's, I think that's what they call convergent evolution. Mm. Uh, lots of different cultures in different places come up with the same idea at the same time. It's a, it's a really beautiful little grouping of bright, sparkly, pretty stars. And so they sort of attributed feminine characteristics to it and called them sisters, the seven sisters. So we've had a look at the Pleiades. It's a, it's a really, really lovely looking star cluster. In the northern part of the sky, in the northwestern part of the sky at the moment, it, it looks pretty dull. There aren't many bright stars around. You know, there's not a lot to see, you think. If you could get a look through a telescope, you'll find that actually there's plenty to see, lots of galaxies, star clusters, nebulae, those sorts of things that aren't bright enough to be seen by the unaided eye. And astronomers call these deep sky objects. They're the ones that you do need a telescope for. Now, turning to the planets, Mercury and Saturn are very low down on the western horizon at the moment at sunset during the first week of December. You'll probably have trouble spotting them actually in the twilight glow. And both planets will be lost in the glare of the sun for a while there. Saturn's on the other side of, of the sun and Mercury is about to disappear in the glare as well. Mercury, though, will reappear at the end of December in the morning sky above the eastern horizon before dawn as will Saturn it'll pop back into the interview in the eastern morning sky but later on a bit during January it'll pop up again Mars is out of view during the evening at the moment but it's it's rising in, in the east around about two o'clock in the morning so you have to be up pretty early Jupiter rises in the wee hours of the morning as well so both planets will be best seen by early risers people who get up early or shift workers that kind of thing that's Jonathan Nally editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine and this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has confirmed that male circumcision and antiviral drugs can dramatically reduce infection rates for the human immunodeficiency virus HIV, which causes AIDS. The research by Johns Hopkins University and reported in the New England Journal of Medicine is the first to track a large group of people before, during and after the start of an HIV prevention program. Scientists examined some 34,000 people from the early 2000s through to 2016, focusing on one of the world's hardest hit AIDS regions in Uganda. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, this one region accounts for almost two-thirds of the global total of new HIV infections. Some 25.6 million people, a third of the region's population, are now living with HIV AIDS. The study has confirmed the success of widespread adaption of HIV prevention measures. The use of antiretroviral therapy among infected people rose steadily from 12% in 2006 through to 69% in 2016. And the proportion of men who were circumcised nearly quadrupled from about 15% in 1999 to 59% in 2016. The proportion of HIV-infected people in whom the amount of virus in their blood, that is their viral load, fell to near zero, at which point transmission is virtually stopped, rose from 42% in 2009 to 75% in 2016. Evidence of behavioural changes, however, was weaker. For example, the rate of condom use didn't rise. But during the study period, younger people appear to be far less likely to initiate sex. The data showed that the number of new HIV infections has begun to fall. From 1999 to 2006, the average was 1.17 cases for every 100 people. 
But by 2016, that figure had fallen to just 0.66 cases per 100 people. With statistical adjustments, that's a net decline of 42%. The drop in HIV incidence was seen in both men and women, although the drop was greater in men, more than 50%, compared to about 30% for women. Researchers say the difference was most likely due to the direct risk-lowering effect of circumcision among men. Shop the Play-Doh's Closet Black Friday event in North Charleston and West Ashley and let the deals begin. You know Play-Doh's Closet always has a huge selection of trendy recycled styles at amazing prices, but Black Friday deals are different. They're better. We've been holding back some of our best inventory, and you won't want to miss our Black Friday event. Save on gently used styles from Patagonia, Lululemon, Lily Pulitzer, and hundreds of popular brands. Play-Doh's Closet is ready to let the Black Friday deals begin. Play-Doh's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Paleontologists have discovered a new extinct species of marsupial lion in northwestern Queensland. The unique 19 million year old fossils were uncovered in the Riversley World Heritage Area, already famous for numerous dinosaur fossils. The findings, reported in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology, include an almost complete skull, teeth, and upper arm bones. The new species, named Wakalea scartenii, is estimated to have weighed about 23 kilograms and possess distinctive large blade-like teeth which are characteristic of marsupial lions. A new study looking for possible genetic factors in male sexual orientation have found differences in specific genes between gay and straight guys. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Scientific Reports, are based on studies of 1,000 homosexual and 1,200 heterosexual men, mostly of European ancestry. Researchers say the differences were found in genes already linked to a potential role in sexual orientation. The authors found two specific genetic regions where the differences were more common than average between the two groups. One was linked to the development of a brain region which can alter with sexual orientation, while the other was linked to a thyroid function. However, the authors warn their results are at best speculative and aren't pointing to a gay gene. About 6% of people identify as gay. Previous studies had already highlighted two genetic regions linked to male homosexuality, XQ28 first identified in 1993, and AQ12 found in 2005. Studies have also shown that gay kids are more likely to have a gay sibling. That suggested that the traits are genetically linked and passed on. But if there really is a gay gene, wouldn't it be passed on by gay parents? And while gay people do occasionally have children, overall they have about 80% less kids than straight parents. So, wouldn't any gay genes be passed down eventually die out? Well, it appears it doesn't work that way. Scientists studying epigenetics have recently found that an additional trigger may be needed. They suggest that everyone has the so-called gay gene, but the thing is it's usually inactive, and it's only activated when a methyl group is attached to a specific DNA region and turns it on, a process which I'm assured doesn't require dance music or a good fashion sense. And finally for now, a new twist in the perennial argument about which is smarter, dogs or cats. As you'd expect, it all has to do with their brains, especially the number of neurons in their cerebral cortex, the little grey cells associated with thinking, planning and complex behaviour. The new study counted the number of cortical neurons in the brains of cats and dogs, as well as in a number of other mammalian carnivores, including lions, bears, raccoons, hyenas and ferrets. Researchers also studied the brains of other mammals, expecting to find the brains of carnivores have more cortical neurons than the brains of the herbivores they prey upon. That's because hunting's far more demanding cognitively speaking compared to the herbivore's primary strategy of finding safety in sheer numbers. However, the researchers found that proved not to be the case. The authors found that the ratios of neurons to brain size in small and medium-sized carnivores was about the same as that of herbivores. And that suggests just as much evolutionary pressure on the herbivores to develop the brain power to escape from the predators as what it does on the carnivores to catch them. In fact, for the largest carnivores, the neuron to brain size was actually lower. They also found that the brain of a relatively medium-sized dog, like a golden retriever, has far more neurons than the brains of hyenas, lions or brown bears, even though the bigger predators have brains physically up to three times larger. Oh, and as to which is smarter, the dog or the cat? Well, the findings reported in the journal Frontiers of Neuroanatomy concluded that dogs have about 530 million cortical neurons, while cats have about 250 million. That compares to the 16 billion in the average human brain. However, none of this explains why dogs are willing to roll in or eat feces and vomit, while cats will force you to serve them only the very finest of foods. It seems there's far more to being clever than just the amount of neurons. 
You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 